It is uh, now my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker this morning, former Governor James Florio. You have his bio in, in the program, but I would be remiss if I didn't take a second or two to speak briefly about him before he addresses you this morning. Governor Florio has spent most of his uh, career in public service and is an authority on environment and energy issues. He served in the U.S. Congress for 16 years, from 1974 through 1990, during which time he authored the Comprehensive Environmental Response Compensation Liability Act, known as the Superfund Law, and was chairman of the House Subcommittee with jurisdiction over environmental matters, where he was involved with drafting or passage of almost every piece of federal legislation related to the environment. Jim Florio served as governor of this state from 1990 through 1994. And as governor, he was responsible for signing into law the Clean Water Enforcement Act and championed the environment throughout his tenure as the governor of this state. Unrelated to environmental issues, but in my opinion, equally impressive, the governor was instrumental in landmark state policy decisions involving school financing, welfare reform, health care cost containment, and the extraordinarily difficult and courageous decisions involving the ban on assault weapons and major tax policy initiatives that significantly improved the state's financial situation. Governor Florio is the founding partner of the law firm of Florio, Peruzzi, Steinhardt, and Fader, and was the founder of, and CEO of Xpand, an asset management company here in the state. The governor is also a senior policy fellow at the Blaustein School, of Planning and Public Policy at Rutgers University, where he teaches courses in executive and legislative policy making and decision making, all related to public policy. On a personal note, I had the honor and the pleasure to work for the governor as his budget director and comptroller. I remember when I interviewed for the job, I was a holdover from the Kane administration. The governor ended the interview with the uplifting comment, well, I think I'll take a chance on you, Rich. Well, I'm sure glad he did, and I found the governor, of course, to be a person of great knowledge, critical judgment, a person who is wise and savvy, and most important, a person of highest integrity and a really nice guy. Governor Florio has a long-standing commitment to the issues of sustainability in the environment that we are discussing here today. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce to you uh, Governor James Florio. Thank you very much, and uh, good morning to everyone. This is a very impressive crowd, a very important subject. I want to thank Rich and Steve for their efforts in putting us all together this morning. I want to also um, say that I appreciate um, Rich's very nice introduction. Although I have to confess, I'm getting a little apprehensive about nice introductions since a while back. I was introduced at a dinner that I attended. I received an award. And the fellow who was making the presentation said the very, very nice things. And then when he concluded his remarks, he said, and now I just want to introduce Governor Florio, who is the very model of what a public official should be. And I was impressed. I went home, told my wife about it. And then she reminded me that the dictionary definition of model is a small replica of the real thing. <laughs> so, so the Cinda keeps me held more. But I, also, I want to also just share with you very rapidly um, a story that is real and occurred yesterday. And maybe some of you can identify with this if you've had occasions to be speaking before groups. Rich, uh, courteous as he always is, provided me with an advanced copy of his introductory remarks that he just gave, which was fine. I got them and I read through them last night. And I'm, as I'm reading through them, I'm becoming terrorized. I'm, I'm frozen in fear because he's introducing me and he's going to saying how we're going to spend a lot of time today dealing with homeland security and emergency response capability. I said, I have clearly screwed up. Um, <laughs> but I found out later that he sent me inadvertently a copy of the last forum's opening remarks. <laughs> so so we're, all, we're all ready to go on the right topic today. <laughs> let, <laughs> let me, uh, first of all, make the observation that um, longevity as some versions, not many, 
but a couple of virtues. And when I say that, I calculate roughly that I came into government in 1969 when I was elected to the state legislature for the first time. That's 40 years ago, which is very troubling for me to appreciate, but the fact of the matter is there are some virtues for longevity, not many, but some virtues, and one of them is the whole idea of having some perspective on things. By virtue of being around, you can get some perspective and get a sense of how things are changing, how things are not changing, as the case may be. And what I wanted to do is to share with you today some observations about some of the changes related to the topic that we're talking about uh, through the course of this whole day. And I think it's my main mission to provide you with some context in order in which you can evaluate the things that are said by the very esteemed panels that are taking place uh, today. And I think one of the fundamental concepts of sustainability, a very important one, is to see if we can strive for sustainable prosperity. And one of the models for achieving sustainable prosperity is an attempt to try to bring into balance the three variables that are absolute necessary components. One, of course, is growth. We want to have growth that generates jobs, revenues, rateables. A second variable is the, having the energy necessary to fuel that growth. That's a very important component of sustainable prosperity as well. And third, and un unexpectedly for some people, is um, environmental sensitivity, so as to make sure that the growth is sustainable. The history is full of examples of where we've had environmental insensitivity and had intermittent or episodic growth. Strip mining, uh, wasteful water practices, um, a whole bunch of other things. Uh, as I said, strip mining is one of the ones that's most important. But clear cutting of forests, that's been a source of um, unsustainable uh, growth as well. Um, I think it's very important for all of us to appreciate the fact that equilibrium is not easy to achieve in having those three variables in balance. It's, it's, not a, it's not an easy thing to do to have growth and energy and sustainable environmental sensitivity in balance and equilibrium and because it's not a static situation. As times change, things will change as well. The quest is even more difficult in times such as this. And this is a point I want to develop a little bit, that these are not normal times. The fact of change being a constant is sort of a cliche. But there are those periods of historic transformation that are somewhat disruptive. For the history students in the audience, we think of the end of the 19th century, the beginning of the 20th century, when um, we went from being an agrarian economy to an industrial economy. There's a wonderful book, that, uh, particularly for the people from Columbia, Richard Hofstetter, The Age of Reform, talks about the trauma of those times. These are times like that in the sense that they are changes that are taking place that are rapid, they're dramatic, and they're extremely complex. And I think what we know about such times is there is great dislocation, there's great stress, there's great anxiety for times such as these. You pick the sector, whether we talk about corporate governance, financial services, you know, health care, telecommunications, or the topic we're talking about today, energy. These are, are areas and sectors that are going through transformational change. Over a transition period, and I don't know how long that's going to be, two years, 10 years, but over a transitional period, all of those sectors and just about every other sector are going to go through systemic change. We're not going to be talking about marginal change, mar change at the end, we're talking about change that will be dramatically different from what we've known in the past in terms of our economy. A characteristic, as I say, is dislocation, and that is always somewhat difficult. One of the other characteristics is a high degree of alienation as people see things not working. And again, not unexpectedly. If, in fact, you've got policies from a different day, the facts on the ground have changed, you should not be surprised at the politics, the, the policies, the agencies, don't work very well. I mean, this last experience we've had with Wall Street, financial services, for the most part, you know, most of the laws we have were created in the Depression, in the 30s. Nobody knew anything about derivatives. Nobody knew anything about 
interest rate swaps. Why should we be surprised that the system didn't address those problems? And so what it is we have to do is to try to make new policies and even create a new policy framework within which we can manage change so as to minimize stress and maximize the opportunities that come with change. That's something that's extremely important and to say we want to make sure we can minimize disruption. The disruption that I'm making reference to and the alienation we see almost every day. I mean, all the craziness that took place at the healthcare town meetings, the, the tea parties that we see going on, all of the rest of the animosity that's generated, in large measure as a result of the disruption, dislocation, that people have difficulties trying to comprehend as to why this is happening. I'm working hard, I'm trying to take care of my family, and yet nothing seems to be operating. The government doesn't seem to be functioning very well in some of the basic things that we want government to do. That's the period of time that we're in. And I think it's very important for all of us to understand that in order to create that framework that I've talked to you about, we have to have an understanding as to what the trends are that are causing the disruption, what the forces at work are that are causing the dislocations. And that's not easy. It entails all of us becoming a little more involved in what it is that's going on so we can understand the nature of the problem. You can't fix the problem if you don't know what the problem is. There are no answers if you don't know what the questions are. So I think that's a, today's forum, obviously, is a good example of efforts to try to get to a better understanding of what the problems are. In the energy policy area, uh, we have only recently started to focus and appreciate the need for a new energy policy. I was astounded when I found out what the scope of activities are at USDOE when I was on the Secretary's Advisory Board um, during the Clinton years. Because the resources are almost exclusively devoted to cleaning up nuclear waste. I mean, that's, that sounds like a strange thing, but it happens to be the fact. Disproportionately, the researchers, resources at DOE are designed to deal with that serious problem, but clearly there are other things that we should be dealing with in energy. And I'm pleased to tell you that Secretary Chow under this administration, is now starting to allocate resources um, in a much more sensible way, in a much more diverse, uh, diverse way to really cope with the problems that we deal with. As I say, I was amazed when I served on the Secretary's board about the misallocation of resources. Now I think we have a greater recognition of the full scope of the problems associated with such a limited approach to energy policy. We better understand the consequences of our over-dependence on overseas fossil fuel sources, particularly in the Middle East. We have an understanding now it has defense ramifications in terms of defense budget, uh, uh, foreign affairs inclinations being involved with the Middle East. We've come to appreciate the volatile instability for our economy, dealing with over-dependence upon unstable nations or unfriendly nations, think Nigeria, think Venezuela. Um, those things are very important to um, us, and we have to address them. And then, of course, there's the um, environmental consequences of having a policy such as we've had with over-dependence on fossil fuels in general and fossil fuels coming from the um, Middle East, and climate change being the most significant of um, those types of things. And the impact of climate change on public health, agriculture, um, economic consequences, uh, water resources, all of those things are extremely important that slowly but surely the American people are being educated about. And that's something that is extremely important for all of us to, uh, to do. The New York Times, by the way, had a really interesting editorial a couple of weeks ago talking about climate change and its impact upon national security. An agency or a think tank for the Pentagon came forward and said that unless we deal with climate change, our military national security position is going to be jeopardized because of mass migrations as a result of border wars between countries that are going to be occurring because of the consequences of, of global warming. The Obama administration has put in place, I think, some very good energy uh, initiatives so that the nation has on its radar screen some of these issues that you're going to be talking about um, today. I think it's important to appreciate that the stimulus bill that was made reference to, 
the cap and trade legislation, which is hopefully working its way through the Congress, uh, alternative energy uh, tax credits, investment tax credits, producer tax credits, are all evidence of the good intentions to try to put on the front burner the, um, these agenda items that we can focus on and we can start to learn the dimensions of these problems to start then working on remedial actions. I think it's important to also appreciate the fact that Washington is very important to all of our deliberations. But as the, dumb, the bumper sticker says, you know, we have to think globally and act locally. And that's what today, in some respects, is all about. I'm more very pr proud of the fact that New Jersey has been in the front ranks of trying to focus attention on the issues that we're talking about today. And it's actually done a very, very good job. Uh, the Corazon administration has updated our energy master plan the first time since I was in office, 17 years since the energy master plan has been updated. And they've done that to provide us with a roadmap, particularly people at the local level, particularly um, other organizations, private sector operatives, public sector organizations, um, nonprofits play a very, very important role in trying to achieve the goals, not only of the stimulus plan and the other federal energy initiatives, but also the state initiatives that we've undertaken. The plan, the Energy Master Plan, by the way, it's infinitely readable. For those of you who have access to um, uh, the, uh, the, the master plan, I would urge you to read it because it does have lots of good things that are good ideas and will give us great guidance. I've heard someone describe the plan as a three-legged stool. The first leg is to design policy for conservation and efficiency. Extremely important. The easiest part makes the most sense, most cost-effective initiatives can come out of that. The second part of the policy is to maximize alternative energy sources, clean energy sources. And the third part is to be able to provide us with adequate baseline capacity uh, for energy to be able to use uh, that energy for the ultimate needs of our growing, vibrant state economy. I think it's um, important for all of us to understand that um, this document, the Energy Master Plan, will provide us with guidance for legislative as well as administrative activities uh, for the state of New Jersey. And guidance for those, well, I suspect many in this audience, who are involved in organizations that want to go forward providing for sustainable prosperity uh, on the basis of good energy sources that will be there when we need them. I want to briefly tick off some of the legislative and administrative actions that are already taking place in New Jersey that um, highlight things that we can be doing and should be doing to achieve the goals of the Energy Master Plan, which I think are compatible with the goals of most of the people who are sensitive to the things we're talking about today all across the nation. I suspect many of you are aware of the uh, greenhouse gas emissions um, REGI program, the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, which is the program that's been put into effect by a number of states in the Northeast designed to reduce greenhouse gas emissions from power plant facilities. Well, in addition to that, in New Jersey, Governor Corzine has signed into law something called the Global Warming Response Act, which is the follow-up to the governor's previous executive order designed to have a most aggressive greenhouse gas reduction programs in the country. The goals are to reduce emissions to 1990 standards, 1990 levels rather, by uh, something like 70 percent. And by 80 percent, I'm sorry, by the greenhouse gas emission goals for 2050, 20, 2050, um, is 80 percent. And the significance of the law is a supplement to the REGI system because the law deals not just with power plant emissions, but with all substantial emission, emitters um, of greenhouse gases. And the system is, in response to the law, by the way, DEP has put forward an um, action plan for global warming. And the state is going to have now a roadmap as to how to achieve those, those goals. On the REGI program, the governor's efforts to implement REGI um, have been very, very successful. We have an auction process that yields substantial amounts of money. I think it's twice a year now. And the program that we've used in New Jersey has been designed to finance the clean energy program. That is the 
resources from the auction are used to particularly focus on energy efficiency for commercial and industrial industries. We've been able to focus on combined heat and power initiatives, which is a very, very cost-effective way of generating energy, largely with natural gas. But I'll talk a little bit more about that later on. We have assistance for energy customers financed out of the resources for the Reggie auction. And we have a whole host of other programs that are being financed out of this. And I suspect the other states in the region that are part of the Reggie program are likewise going to be using those resources to achieve the energy goals that we're all pretty much signed on to. We want to also reduce energy consumption. This goes to the first leg of the stool that I spoke about earlier, uh, energy efficiency and energy conservation. We have in our state a program that we call the Clean Energy Program. The BPU, the Board of Public Utilities, the regulatory agency in New Jersey, has budgeted $1.2 billion from 2009 to 2012 to support our clean energy program. The majority of the money supports energy efficiency investments. This, uh, by the way, is something that the private sector signs on to uh, with great diligence because clearly the private sector understands energy efficiency entails reducing costs. Reducing costs entails higher degrees of productivity. Higher degrees of productivity result in greater degrees of competitiveness. And in the international global arena that we are in, in this day and age, um, competitiveness is the be-all and the end-all in terms of goals for the private sector. The clean energy program, by the way, in New Jersey is also funded by New Jersey ratepayers to assume uh, societal benefits to, and to make sure that we provide clean, renewable sources of energy for all of our people. During the first five years of this program in New Jersey, we have achieved some very, very noticeable accomplishments. I want to tick them off. 100,000 homes have received energy efficiency improvements. Almost 5,000 businesses have received energy efficiency support as well. Nearly 16,000 new homes were built and certified by New Jersey's Energy Star program. That's 20% of all the new homes that were built. And we're looking to expand on that percentage. More than 4,000 schools, businesses, and residents installed renewable energy systems that will generate clean, emission-free electricity and reduce energy costs over the years to come. In 2008 alone, the investments from the Clean Energy Program resulted in enough energy savings to provide requirements, energy requirements for something like 80,000 homes in New Jersey. And the natural gas needs for approximately 5,000 gas-heated homes as well. We are um, involved with utility investment in the energy facilities. In response to the governor's programs, particularly the governor's economic assistance and recovery plan, that's New Jersey's stimulus plan. In response to that, we have been in contact uh, with a number of the utilities, particularly PSE&G, New Jersey Natural Gas, South Jersey Gas, um, those companies have been particularly responsive to the governor's program, um, where he called upon utilities to um, invest in energy efficiency and energy infrastructure to create jobs. They responded to this program very well and will invest some $225 million over the next 18 months, creating 1,000 direct jobs as a result of that initiative. So we in New Jersey are very fortunate in having a utility industry that is particularly sensitive and is particularly responsive to the public interest. The, um, another initiative of the governors in our state was um, to sign legislation that provides schools and municipalities with alternative methods of financing uh, energy efficiency and renewable energy product projects. The bill allows schools and municipalities to enter into 10 to 15 year contracts on power purchase agreements. That's something that's extremely important because in order to have stability to ensure private investment coming into the, you've got to be able to have long-term contracts. And that is something that's an important insight for all of us to have as well. The major problem in some respects for renewable energy projects is not technology. It's financing. How it is that you go and induce private sector investment particularly so as to be able to give them the certainty and the security 
that their investments will yield sufficient dividends down the road to induce them to be part of the whole process um, as well. Renewable energy, again, uh, that's the second leg of the stool that I spoke about. Uh, renewable energy um, through our Energy Master Plan is very much um, aggressive in New Jersey. On the wind side, on the wind side, we're shooting for something like 3,000 megawatts by 2020, 1,000 megawatts by 2013. As some of you may know, there are three specific companies that are already out in the water off the coast of New Jersey doing the preliminary testing. These companies are extremely um, active, and this is something that is going to happen. We like to think that we're going to be the first offshore wind farm um, in the nation uh, coming off the coast of New Jersey. These, um, these are big facilities, roughly 350 megawatts each that are being planned. And they are great generators of secondary benefits aside from the energy. Whole new industries can be created. Um, I want to say that on the solar side, we take great pride, we think, in leading the country. That I guess we're second to California in total investment, total action, but we're first per capita um, in, in the nation. That we've got something like 40,000 installations and 90 megawatts of power already being generated under the program that we have. Furthermore, the governor has set a goal to have 2,000 megawatts of solar power installed in the state by 2020. We are the state, the, the state with the nation's first solar renewable energy certificate, we call them solar Rex, S Rex, which are renewable energy credits particularly unique to solar installations. This is a private sector initiative to try to get the private sector to come in to buy these certificates in a way so as to finance the installation of not only rooftop solar, but also mass land arrays. And we're focusing on something we have lots of in New Jersey, which is landfills. We have a lot of abandoned landfills, and we're looking at them as prime sites for um, aggregated solar arrays. New Jersey, um, we're trying to save New Jersey consumers um, money which is obviously not always a good thing to do. The master plan spells out a very creative, comprehensive energy strategy to reduce the amount of money the consumers will be spending on energy by reducing the amount the consumers will use. Um, it's obviously a trade-off. Rates may go up, but to the degree you can reduce the usage on balance, we're hopeful this will be a very big help to consumers around the state. Um, what we're doing is developing some 1,500 megawatts of cogeneration, this combined heat and power, new, sophisticated, cleaner energy usage, um, largely gas powered, something that we're focusing on because it will be very helpful as we go forward with wind power and solar power, which obviously by definition are intermittent. You have to have backup power and combined heat and power uh, cogeneration is a very uh, important initiative. We are also seeking to stimulate our economy by ensuring the reliability of our utility system. In April of this year, the governor's economic stimulus plan that I made reference to, the BPU approved utility infrastructure programs as part of that whole initiative and um, approved spending proposals for five of our large utilities, Atlantic City Electric, Elizabethtown Gas, New Jersey Natural Gas, PSE&G, and South Jersey Gas Company. The uh, programs that were approved will result in some 1,300 new hires and approximately 14,000 new direct, indirect jobs. That is to say the BPU authorized the expenditure of these companies' private sector monies into infrastructure improvements, which is a great economic generator of jobs and, and revenues. The cogeneration development I've spoken to you about is a major goal. Uh, we're providing incentives to move to cogeneration. For example, the funds will provide $450 per kilowatt rebate to those who become involved in cogeneration initiatives. It's also in line with our whole idea of having distributed generation around, around the state. So not to be overly reliant upon mass energy producers, rather to have microgrids created so as to be able to have smaller generating facilities where appropriate. Currently, the state has over 3,000 megawatts of cogeneration. We're anticipating increasing that in the next number of years by 50 
uh, percent, and that is a good thing as well. Smart grid development, that some of you have been following. We're working with the electric utility companies to identify the appropriate technologies to develop pilot projects to determine the effectiveness of these technologies. Demand response, demand management initiatives are all ways of building into the system, in some respects, automatic stimulators. One of the problems we have in New Jersey that I suspect everybody has as well is peak pricing. When there are peak periods, prices go up for everyone, that's a serious problem. We in New Jersey have a unique problem, and that is a problem with a great resource, the Jersey Shore. The Jersey Shore in the summer, when towns in the winter that have 3,000 people have 40,000 people, is a time when all the air conditioners go on and peak pricing becomes a very serious problem. So we're very interested in having smart growth, um, smart meters, other types of initiatives that will allow us to better manage our energy. And lastly, let me just talk about um, job creation, which clearly is something that we all feel very strongly about, particularly in these uh, economic times. In New Jersey, our Department of Labor and Workforce Development has developed industry-recognized job training programs. Uh, for green jobs. I also am associated with the Heldred Center for Workforce Development out of Rutgers. We recently held uh, an all-day forum and we had people from the utility industries in as well as a number of other people and it was just interesting how hungry the utilities are for future employees that because of demographics, because of retirements, many of the jobs that are currently there and will be sustained um, are going to need people to be trained for linemen and other types of jobs that are going to be ongoing. But even more importantly is we need somebody to start training the people for the jobs of the future. You know, wind turbine technicians, solar installers, workplace auditors, someone's got to go um, be training those types of folks. And in New Jersey we have um, some very, very good programs that we've put into place. One variation of the program, we're trying to do a lot of urban oriented training. So provide job opportunities for the folks in the urban areas who have disproportionately high unemployment rates. The, we have the program, one of the programs we have is one that um, will qualify some 300 qualified workers by the end of this year. After their training is up, the participants will in fact go work in industry positions that have already effectively been promised to them. And the Department of Labor is, about, is going to provide for on-the-job training for the first six months with 50 percent of the minimum $15 an hour wage paid for by the state for that initial six month training period. So this is something that makes a whole lot of sense. Let me conclude by saying that this is a very important, important project that we're talking about. All the cluster of things that I focus upon are really going to determine the well-being and the economic health of this nation. So when the president talks about health care and energy being important things to deal with not only the current recession, but deal with the problems of the future, I think he's very much on target. I hope that the folks from out of New Jersey, because I know there are good things going on in Pennsylvania, New York, and I suspect all across the country, will excuse my New Jersey-oriented chauvinism in taking great pride in what it is we've done, but I do take pride because we have been on the cutting edge, very much as we were on the cutting edge of many environmental policies, because we had many environmental problems and therefore we were forced to deal with them. In some respects, uh, we had had, we've had blackouts, we've had brownouts. Like every summer when people go to the shore, there's always the concern, will there be enough power? So we have the problems accordingly. We feel a need to be upfront in terms of being out there on the leading edge of trying to address these problems. And we think we can contribute to the national sets of solutions that we, um, will have to be uh, conjured up as we go forward. And of course, um, this resource, Princeton University, the Woodrow Wilson School, is another of our contributions in New Jersey to the well-being of the rest of the state. So I give you uh, greetings from the, uh, from the state of New Jersey, and I would just say that I hope that you have a good, productive session today. Thank you very much. We have a, a few minutes for questions. We have the microphones here. If you would like to come down and ask a question or two, this young lady seems like she is not coming down to ask a question or two, but we have a lady here.
recent graduate of Woodrow Wilson School and a citizen of Pennsylvania. Um, from a purely objective point of view, New Jersey is a very good model for the states in this area. But Pennsylvania, as you know, is cursed with cheap coal. And the power of the uh, coal lobby is evident in the alternative energy portfolio standards that uh, Pennsylvania has, has uh, created in comparison to New Jersey's renewable portfolio standard. We can't even call ours a renewable portfolio standard because it includes coal and methane uh, as alternative energies. If you were in the very difficult position of being the governor of Pennsylvania, uh, can, can you offer us any advice about how to deal with this and how to yeah. uh, increase the actual uh, positive effects of the portfolio standards in Pennsylvania? Well, Ed, Ed Rendell is a good friend of mine. I've known him and I've seen him try to address the problem that he's got. It clearly, the constituency is there. It's a very important part of the environment of his economy in the state. And the governor talks about clean coal technology, which is fine. Um, I'm just not sure it is economically viable in the near term, if, if ever. But there are technologies, coal uh, sequestration of carbon dioxide and so on. Uh, there are actually projects that are being talked about. But it's going to be a while. It's going to be a while, if at all, we ever get to the point of actually extracting carbon dioxide from coal. There are technologies that have worked in the past, I mean, in, in, in Nazi Germany, um, in South Africa. There were clean coal technologies, but they were not economically viable. They were ne necess necessitated by the circumstances that those folks were in. So it's liable to be a while um, before you get to that point, if you ever get to the point. But I fully understand the governor's difficulty. The governor, by the way, is doing a wonderful job uh, actually, in some respects, to our detriment in New Jersey, of sort of seducing industries. He's got a Spanish wind uh, terminal company, a turbine company that's come there. So he's doing a good job in terms of bringing you have more onshore wind than we will ever have because you have more elevations. So uh, we don't have onshore wind capacity in New Jersey very extensively. So it's a hard thing, but I think he's doing his best. Any creative policy ideas you might think of as you're sitting here today? I just asked. Go ahead, young lady. Well, someone. <laughs> Yes, sir. Good morning, Governor. It's really an honor to see you again. It's been a few years since I met you the first time down in um, uh, um, Camden, New Jersey. You came to the work group many years ago. It's really good to see you. I didn't expect you to be here. I'm, I'm honored to see you this morning. My question in particular is um, concerning the urban training for the um, utilities programs. What programs, can you be more specific with that? Are you familiar with any specific programs that the utilities are up and running or looking to implement for the urban training pieces? Well, there are specific programs. I mean, the Department of Labor in New Jersey has got urban-oriented job training programs. Those 300 people that I made reference to that are in a program right now, by the end of the year, will be qualified to go in and particularly do um, energy audits, uh, evaluating the capability. There's new software that's out there establishing baselines for energy use so that um, there's even proposals that part cash discounts or cash benefits. Connecticut has a renewable energy credit for conservation. Um, and urban areas are clearly particularly susceptible to being able to bring about efficiency. The density of the housing allows more ability to, on a per dollar basis, extract conservation um, benefits out of those programs. Are there, so realistic, you would, are there realistic numbers as far as uh, meeting, being able to meet the needs of the urban context as far as the dollar costs. Oh no, I think there are realistic numbers that can be achieved there. And the utilities know it themselves. BSE&G particularly has a very aggressive program. Since they cover Camden, Newark, all the big, most of the big cities in the state are covered by them, I would suggest that you reach out to them and they'll give you some information. Oh, I certainly will. Thank you. Thank you. Ma'am. Uh, my question is Can you speak up a little bit? Oh, I think that's better. Okay. My question is about uh, one thing that I thought maybe was missing from the long list of impressive list of initiatives in New Jersey, and that's uh, public transport. And I was wondering if you have any thoughts on uh, getting more public transport in New Jersey. It seems like it would need not only 
investments, but also some kind of mind shift potentially. I'm so not sure I can. <coughs> about uh, public transport and public what transport. Yeah. Is there yeah. any plans, or do you see it developing in the near future? Since it takes yeah. probably mind shift, not just investment. Well, you're, you're correct in saying that the um, energy master plan really did not address transportation. The transportation department is working on a supplement to the plan because clearly we all understand mass transit is a great energy conservation mechanism and is good just to avoid congestion and aggravation for all of us who are tired of the two-hour commutes uh, that we have. But New Jersey has been uh, actually fairly good over the years in trying to claim uh, its share of the federal largesse for mass transit. The difficulty, of course, is that our whole being has been determined by our position between Philadelphia and New, and, um, New York. So if you're going that way, it's OK. If you're going the other way, you have a serious problem. But I think um, there are proposals now. I don't know how many of you travel on the 78 corridor in the morning. It's a large parking lot. There's actually a proposal to restore rail service that was there 30 years ago. The rights of way are still there. There are proposals to restore rail service from New York up to Phillipsburg. Um, and that would be a very, very good thing. But you're right, mass transit. I'm pleased to see the Obama administration is looking very seriously at corridor projects, saying that you know, the ideal corridor is the one we are in, that is the Boston to uh, Washington corridor, and uh, Amtrak's best service is provided on that. But there are lots of other corridors, Detroit to Chicago, uh, San Diego to Los Angeles, and there's money in the stimulus plan for um, that type of uh, initiative to be undertaken. Thank you. Governor, my name is Fred Profeta, and I am a chair of the Mayor's Committee in New Jersey, Mayor's Committee for a Green Future. I represent Maplewood on that group. Uh, my question is this. You uh, correctly mentioned, uh, explained uh, the central role of SolarX in incentivizing renewable energy in New Jersey. How solid do you think the future of that uh, device is in New Jersey? And uh, do you think it may be replaced by something else in the future? For example, in Europe, as you know, they use feed-in tariffs, which is a more direct method of incentivizing. Uh, Ontario and Canada has that. I think Florida is considering that, California also. Where do you see the future of this sort of incentive? Well, the, the solar. The solar problem or the solar opportunity has been largely um, that in order to induce people to go forward, the approach has been largely to put cash up front. Uh, the Germans um, had a cash system, feed-in tariffs, which are mandatory requirements that utilities take the power. And therefore, if you have that long-term contract uh, commitment, people will be induced to come and invest in solar power. And it's worked well. Our utilities have been a little reluctant to sign on to feed-in tariffs. And again, the, the reasoning is understandable that they say, well, long-term contracts, what happens if we have solar changes um, in technology that makes solar power much less expensive than it is today? We've signed a long-term contract for solar at 20 cents a kilowatt hour, and 10 years from now, it is um, 5 cents a kilowatt hour. We don't want to be locked in. I think what we've done is come to some mid-course accommodation with the utilities, and this is still in the process of being worked out right now, whereby they will be signing on to long-term contracts, but there'll be modification opportunities of those long-term contracts. It's striking that balance between flexibility and stability. The utilities want flexibility, the investors want stability, and trying to come up with some reasonable way of accommodating both needs is in the process of being worked on by the BPU and then as soon as they come to an accommodation that everyone is satisfied with, we'll have legislation. There's an assemblyman who's really a wonderful person, um, <clears throat> Upendra Shavakula, is the assemblyman up in the Middlesex County area who is um, the chairman of the relevant committee. Very knowledgeable, I think he's an engineer, so he really understands this stuff and has been very, very useful to uh, the people. Good, thank you. <clears throat> Ma'am. Good morning, Tana Cantor, the Green Economy Media. Um, you mentioned very briefly the concerns about change that people have. And we're certainly seeing now a kind of backlash. We sit here talking to the choir, as it were, and I'm curious about what you would say to people who don't want any form of change, that are really kind of hoping that we could go back to an economy that looks pretty much like it did five years ago. Yeah. That's, it's obviously, it's the ultimate question, as the president is finding out. I mean, there are lots of people that, even if, I, mean, I don't want to get too philosophic here, but I mean, even when you have a status quo that is admittedly flawed, beyond question, 
there's always someone that's doing well by the status quo. And they rarely give up what they're doing well at just in the interest of the public. We all rationalize as to how our interests really mirror the public interests. That's not always the case. Um, so it is going to be somewhat difficult, but I just, I'm convinced, it's been sort of my philosophic commitment to my whole life in public service. <clears throat> People may not get the reality quickly, but they ultimately get it. If you're willing to per persevere in trying to be out there explaining sometimes long-term interests as contrasted with short-term interests. Winston Churchill said once, I think something was very kind of unique and true, that Americans always get it right after they've exhausted all the other alternatives. <laughs> and so I think that there's something to be said for appreciating the fact that there will be folks who don't want to change things. Um, the most frustrating part of this whole dynamic is that when you find folks who are not benefiting from the status quo, who oppose change because they're concerned about change making them worse off than better off. There's a wonderful book by uh, John Kenneth Galbraith called The Culture of Contentment. The theme is really very interesting because it talks about how in 50% turnout elections, which is now most of our elections, as a matter of fact, we have a gubernatorial election <clears throat> this year in New Jersey, and the uh, projections are we'll have a 50% turnout, so half the people won't show up for the election. <clears throat> but Galbraith's theme is in a 50% turnout election, that means that 26% of the population constitutes a majority. And the contented folks usually are the folks that are out there to preserve the status quo, which means that 74% of the eligible electorate is subjected to the policies of the 26% of the contented. I think there's something to that whole idea. So engagement is sort of the heart of participatory democracy. So all of us, as you said, we're sort of talking to the choir here. I suspect everyone here understands you know, the dimensions of most of the things we've talked about here today. But it really means that we have to be apostles for the system. I mean, disciples to go out and talk to everyone to try to get everyone to be educated to the dimensions. I mean, rarely is there one answer to a problem. I mean, there are multiple answers, and there are pluses and minuses to each of them. I've always thought of a politician as a teacher with a large classroom who goes out and talks about the options, what the attractive features are, and then has a responsibility to say, on balance, this is the option that I'm suggesting, and then go try to build support, as is required in a, in a democracy. Democracy is all about making decisions. The way you make it in our sort of diversified society is build a consensus around a particular policy. And it's an educational process. Thank you, Governor. Okay. Good morning. I'm Gary Ireland. I'm an uh, environmental attorney from New York, and I also have a, uh, live out in Sagaponic, Long Island. Out on the island, uh, we, we're subject to the weather and uh, have some um, energy problems because of that. Uh, and I'm interested in finding out how far away you are in New Jersey from wind out on the ocean and how viable that is, given the um, pushback perhaps from uh, fishing industries and from recreation and, and, and other industries that might have conflicts. I'm a um, disciple of wind. I've been to Denmark, um, I've been to Europe, and I've seen Denmark gets 20% of its electricity from offshore wind turbines that are tourist attractions, which is kind of interesting. Um, they've done all the studies on birds, they've done all the studies on uh, impact upon fishing, and there's no question, at least in that setting, that these things on balance, clearly on balance, are overwhelmingly beneficial. Um, New Jersey has, as I said in my remarks, three companies that have been approved for, by the Interior Department for monitoring and of setting up, I think they're in the process of setting up the monitoring uh, facilities to get a real wind profile. There isn't any doubt in most people's mind that the wind offshore of New Jersey is more than sustainable for an economically viable uh, program. The expectations are by 20, I think 2012, 2013, that we should have wind an offshore wind facility uh, in operation. I'm familiar with the Long Island experience, which um, I think was more economic than aesthetic. The Massachusetts experience was aesthetic. Um, the wind turbines off of New Jersey will be anywhere from 12 to 14 miles off. They'll be barely visible. And it's interesting, we have a couple of wind turbines, as some of you know if you go to Atlantic City, on shore, three or four of them, not very many. And it's interesting that the mixed review in terms of aesthetics, those people that swear by them as being almost hypnotizing um, and very attractive. I suspect there are probably other people that don't, don't care for them too much, 
but the fact is that the, the new technologies that are made um, by the wind turbine companies, GE is one, there's a company Vestas, there's a Japanese company or so, uh, there's a German company too. The new technologies are very efficient, very quiet, and as I say, with appropriate placement, they can be out of sight. Thank you. Good morning, Governor Florio. My name is uh, Bob France. <clears throat> I'm the Vice President for Environment, Health, and Safety for uh, Tyco International. Sure. <clears throat> and uh, I have both a comment and a question. And my comment, is, and it relates actually to the, the question you just answered, uh, is there was a recent piece in Nature about with respect to alternative energy and the amount of uh, land that it consumes in many cases, whether it's wind, solar, um, biofuels, uh, all of those require a large amount of land to be able to, uh, to, be able to, to prosper and, and be able to produce the energy. Um, it, sort of the, the, uh, the question piece of this relates to uh, many areas of the country that are trying to site uh, new facilities, uh, whether it be a, a small uh, solar installation on a rooftop or a, uh, a wind installation in someone's backyard, find that uh, the, the individuals proposing to, to site these installations find that local opposition prevents them. Uh, many of the housing, many of the zoning laws in some cases are even being structured in a manner to prevent them because of the issues associated with uh, aesthetics and, and, and those sorts of things. And I'm wondering, uh, this, this gets to the question of balance and democracy and all of those issues, but I'm wondering uh, uh, what your thoughts are on that and are there some ways to both encourage individuals and, uh, and, and even in some cases larger installations of these kinds of, uh, of alternative energy uh, while still obviously respecting the interests of, of the, the parties who surround them. My experience, at least in New Jersey, and actually in some of the other states that I've been in, is that the whole NIMBY syndrome really is not as prominent in the siting of alternative energy systems. Um, and the more people are signing to have them, particularly solar, uh, the more people are uh, inclined to actually think that there's something that they want to have not only in terms of their uh, actually energy costs, but it's almost part of, being, part of being relevant to the new realities. On the wind side, the wind side, you know, we have people who like to put up individual wind facilities in their backyard. I'm not sure that there's a great future in that, not only from the standpoint of the neighbors, but also the economic viability of single wind turbines for your house. Um, I think what you have in some areas, Pennsylvania being a good example, when you have good locations that have more space than New Jersey has at uh, elevated heights and some more remoteness, you have the opportunity for wind turbine, on land wind turbine facilities. So I think that there is a, there's a future in that area. And now, as this becomes more commonplace, there's going to be much less reluctance on the part of individuals to be opponents of these types of things. And as I said, when you start to make the case in a more expansive approach, to deal with foreign affairs. I mean, Alan Greenspan, in his autobiography, acknowledges that Iraq is largely about oil. Well, I mean, if we're concerned about things such as that, we want to get off of our over-dependence upon fossil fuels from overseas. The only way to do that is to start having domestically produced sources of energy and alternative energy systems that are clean are really to commend themselves uh, to all of us. So I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic it's going to be less and less of a problem to try to cite alternative energy systems. Thanks very much. Hi, good morning. I'm Eliza Wasserman. I'm a student here at the Woodrow Wilson School. Um, it's been great to see the state and local governments really being innovators and leading the field with uh, climate and renewable energy policies. And I'm wondering now that the feds have taken the issue up pretty seriously, do you see the political initiative at the state and local level shifting away from innovation and um, pushing the envelope to more implementation and also shifting away from, from innovating uh, on the policy front and more to implementation? or if you see that there's still political will as well any, as any uh, policy arenas for state and local governments to move the field. I'm sorry, can you read the last part? Sure. So state and local governments have been the leaders on the policy front, but now that the feds are taking the lead on that, do you see state and local government shifting away from innovating policy in the field to more implementation, 
or do you still see there's an opportunity for policy innovation? No, I think, I think the implementation is taking place rapidly for a whole bunch of reasons, most of which I've talked about today. The job piece. Um, I attended a forum at the University of Pennsylvania not too long ago. Vice President Biden was there. And he brought six members of the cabinet with him to talk about green jobs. <clears throat> the mayor of Philadelphia was there. The governor of Pennsylvania was there. And clearly, that is, you know, I'm a practical political person in my old days that believe that you know, if you can get private interests moving in a direction that parallels public interests, you're halfway home. <clears throat> this is something that's moving. We're all very sensitized to the need for economic development. We're all sensitized to the need for jobs. And so this holds out the prospect of being able to get good things happening on multiple fronts. So I'm convinced that the states, um, the municipalities, the counties are all doing the right thing in their own interests as well as in the public interest by implementing and taking advantage of some of these stimulus program uh, operations and some of the grants that are coming out of uh, Washington. Well, good morning, Governor Florio. My name is Rob Graff. I'm the manager of energy and climate change initiatives at the Delaware Valley Regional Planning Commission, the MPO for the nine counties of Greater Philadelphia, including uh, Mercer, Camden, Burlington, and Gloucester County, New Jersey. One of the challenges that we've seen in uh, reducing energy use overall, not simply utility use, is our land use patterns and encouraging denser development, transit-oriented development, and sort of more rational land use patterns. Given uh, that Pennsylvania and New Jersey both have home rule and local land use control, what legal and institutional, legal and constitutional changes may be required to actually uh, reach the governor's uh, 2050 goals, which require a lot of land use uh, changes? Well, you, you highlight a very important aspect of energy conservation, as well as generally good public policy in terms of planning. Um, and again, there are lots of opportunities that the um, states have. For New Jersey, and I'm very proud of this, New Jersey has designated um, a good portion of our state as areas that are not going to be developed. So the, the Pinelands is 20% of New Jersey. Most people don't know that. It's a million acres that's 20% of New Jersey that is highly restricted in terms of what you can do in those areas. Um, the Highlands is another area that's something like 800,000 um, acres. And we've, we've held those areas in open area because we want to be able to have good planning, uh, water recharging areas and things of that sort. But it also happens to be driving growth to the more densely populated areas, which is highly desirable for rehabilitation of our urban areas, but also for purposes of energy efficiency and all the other benefits that can come. I was uh, with some folks last night, I don't know how many of you are from New Jersey here, but the whole tier of municipalities up in the north um, east section of our South Amboy, Perth Amboy, Carteret, Rahway, Sayreville, these are all sort of blue collar towns, old industrial towns that looked a little shaky up until a couple of years ago. But now they're building million dollar condominiums. Now, obviously the recession has inhibited that a little bit. But as soon as we're out of this recession, I think that's going to continue because folks are getting tired of the two hour commute. People, if you give them public safety, give them good school systems, they'll move back into those areas. And those towns already are starting to get revitalized. The benefits on the energy scene, the question before about mass transit. All of those towns are going to have mass transit facilities that are tremendously improved over the good ones they have even now. Ferry service from South Amboy into Manhattan. Uh, we're improving our train system in that area that people already use well. So good land use planning is a very important and vital part of energy conservation as well as a host of other things. Thank you, Governor. You're welcome. I apologize to the questionnaires uh, and also to my ex-boss that uh, I have to interrupt them, otherwise we're going to be running late with the rest of the panels. But I can tell, Governor, there's a lot of interest in the comments that you made, and maybe you could even take a question or two if the folks want to see you afterwards or join in. So please join with me in thanking Governor Florio for his <laughs>